Hello. A Passage to India by E. M. Forster was first published a century ago in 1924. It's frequently cited as being one of the greatest novels of all time by publications like Time Magazine and the Modern Library. So I thought it was the perfect time to revisit this book and see if I think it's worthy of this designation of being a modern classic. I did read this when I was at university, but to be honest, I didn't remember much about it or its story. So I just reread it very recently with my online book club. We had such a fascinating discussion about it, and there was a real diversity of opinions about it. Where some people thought it was really powerful and a great read, and others appreciated the themes of it, but found it a bit of a slog. And then some readers that found parts of it actively offensive. So I want to discuss my response to rereading this book and some thoughts about it. And speaking of my online book club,、uh, in March we are just about to start reading Hisham Matar's new novel, My Friends, which some Booker Prize pundits that I follow are already tipping as being a possible winner of this year's Booker Prize.、Uh, so I'll put a link to my online book club below、uh, if you want to check it out and join us in reading this new novel. But、uh, E.M. Forster's、uh, Passage to India. It was actually the final novel that he wrote,、uh, even though the author himself. Went to live on for almost another fifty years、uh, after its publication. His novel Maurice was published posthumously, and he had wrote it、uh, before writing *A Passage to India*. And he had also started a novel called. Arctic summer, but it was incomplete at the time of his death. Now, the overall subject of this novel concerns tensions between East and West during the later days of British colonial rule in the Indian subcontinent. The central question of the story, which is stated at the very beginning, is whether true friendship is really possible between Indians and the English in this context. This plays out through the drama between an Indian. Man named Doctor Aziz, who meets an English woman named Adela Quested, who's recently arrived in India, and there's a mystery or non-mystery about what occurs between them when they go on an excursion to a fictional location called the Marabar Caves. I have to say, I found it a bit challenging to get into this book initially because it launches into a lot of. Dialogue and it's not always clear who is speaking, and it presents a wide range of people. But I quickly became. Fascinated and repelled by a lot of the talk between these characters,、uh, much of it which is frank in its racial and religious prejudice. Forster completely immerses the reader in this colonial environment where interactions are regulated along strict lines. However, there's also a lot of humor that comes through in Doctor Aziz's. Personality and the strategic ways that he tries to navigate this society. There's also a lot of tragic, comic absurdity to some of the outrageous statements that some of these characters make, as well as there being a lot of cross-cultural misunderstandings that arise. Since this novel is partly based on Forster's time of living in India, I assume he actually heard some real people making. Similar pronouncements. The narrative frequently switches between a wider discussion of India as a land and culture and nation, and scenes between the characters. I felt like occasional generalizations and troubling comparisons were a bit more questionable when they were situated in these sections from the authorial perspective. Forster was clearly deeply sympathetic with the struggles in Indians. 
society, but describing the country in such broad terms also feels simplistic, especially when the drama and characters in this story are so nuanced. One of my favorite moments is early on when an exhausted Dr. Aziz enters a mosque and he sees a sweet old English woman named Mrs. Moore who he believes hasn't taken off her shoes, and this confrontation could have easily erupted into a much bigger fight. If the overtly racist characters of Mr. or Mrs. Turton had this encounter, I'm sure they'd have taken great offense and attacked Dr. Aziz. But magnanimous and kind-hearted Mrs. Moore is more eager to foster a connection rather than trying to assert her dominance in this situation, and equally Dr. Aziz is quick to, to see his mistake and find that there's a possible friendship here and it's just a really lovely moment and connection that they have. The way in which Mrs. Moore and Mr. Fielding, who's a headmaster at a college for Indians, the way in which they interact with Dr. Aziz and people in general says a lot about their character. I found both of these characters' fledgling friendship with Dr. Aziz very moving, and I think it's how Forrester shows that commonality can be found when people overcome their preconceptions and their initial prejudice. There's also an emotional section that describes Dr. Aziz's process of mourning his wife, in which Forrester writes, he had known that she would pass from his hands and eyes, but had thought she could live in his mind, not realizing the very fact that we have loved the dead increases their unreality, and that the more passionately we invoke them, the further they recede. That is such an interesting and heart-wrenching statement uh, about the process of losing a loved one. I do wish that Forrester had shown some of Dr. Aziz's interactions with his children to show how his family life operates now without his wife and their mother. But his grief and loss add to the reason why he might be channeling so much of his energy into impressing these recent arrivals from England. And by creating these social connections, he wants to establish a level of respectability within the constructs of this colonial society. Adela Quested arrives in India because she's considering marrying a rather deplorable British city magistrate named Ronnie, uh, who also happens to be Mrs. Moore's son. Adela could be called sweetly naive, or it could be said that the way that she wants to experience the real India is belittling. Like many tourists, she claims to want an authentic experience, but when what she witnesses doesn't match her idea of what she thought she would find, she is discontent. I found this line about her interaction with Dr. Aziz quite significant. In her ignorance, she regarded him as India and never surmised that his outlook was limited and his method inaccurate and that no one is India. It feels really true that the character of a country can only be understood in the multiplicity of its inhabitants because everyone will have their own slanted perspective on it. And it's also obviously important to remember whenever meeting somebody from a different country or culture that they're merely an individual and can't be taken as a representative of a nation as a whole. I found it masterful the way that Forrester creates this slow building tension between Dr. Aziz, who's eager to please these English women, and Miss Quested, who wants to experience the country partly as a way of clarifying to herself whether or not she wants to marry Ronnie. This crescendos in their trip to the Marabar Caves. For the characters, it's a trifling excursion that Dr. Aziz rashly suggests when he wants to avoid the embarrassment of hosting the ladies in his humble home, and they also accept 
his invitation more out of politeness because neither Mrs. Moore or Miss Quested are that interested in visiting, especially when nobody can explain to them the significance of the caves or why they're worthy of a trip. And from this rather tedious and dutiful journey emerges a crisis which brings to a head all of the simmering conflict caused by this untenable existing colonial system. The accusation which emerges from it and Dr. Aziz's arrest are really shocking, but it's also understandable that incidents like this would occur when there's so much cross-cultural tension which is created from this imbalance of power. Such pressure leads to paranoia and clashes where already oppressed people are further victimized. And the racist white colonial inhabitants, of course, seize upon this accusation as an excuse to act out all of the anger and frustration they have against Indians. But just as the story takes a surprising turn, the immediate drama is quickly deflated. This is quite a daring thing for a novel to do in terms of of its plot because such a turnaround would appear to dispel any tension. But it seemed to me that the tension only mounted as the characters were left wondering about the significance of this event and their relationship to each other. It also emphasizes the sentiment that India should become an independent nation. The mystery of the story isn't about whether Dr. Aziz is guilty or not because it's always clear that he's innocent. The real mystery is why honest connections and true friendships between people from these two different nations is impossible in this context. The answer that Forrester seems to present is that these wider divisions aren't necessarily the result of racism, although there are some extremely racist characters in this story, but because of larger economic, social, and political conflicts which are brought about by the colonial system and are actually part of its structure. The character of Fielding did his best to mount a defense for Dr. Aziz, but if Adela hadn't spoken up, it seems doubtful whether Aziz would have gotten off as innocent, and even if he was declared such, his reputation would be completely tarnished, as indeed it was, even though he was unquestionably innocent. Although I'm critical of Adela and I don't think she should be forgiven, it does show a certain amount of bravery that she spoke up and declared that she didn't think Dr. Aziz had attacked her after all. This leaves her totally isolated as racist Mrs. Turton is naturally furious and her embarrassment in court is very funny, but also Mrs. Moore is unprepared to engage with Adela anymore. Forster writes of Adela, she was no longer examining life, but being examined by it. She had become a real person. So Adela feels to me like someone who means well, but then who realizes how her good intentions have very little value when she hasn't dealt with her own unacknowledged prejudices and isn't prepared to embrace the true complexity of the world. Adela is haunted by an echo after her time in the cave, as if it were her conscience pestering her. Mrs. Moore also hears an echo, but has a very different reaction to it because she experiences it as a crisis of faith. It results in a malaise when she realizes that her essential belief in goodness and Christianity can't stand up to the insidious divisions of the real world. We learn of her sad fate, but she'd already withdrawn from trying to forge connections or engage with any of these social issues anymore. Though this is tragic, I think it's perhaps hopeful that we later learn that her children, other than Rani, travel to India and develop an appreciation of the country and Hinduism. But the echo, which seems to be one of the major symbols of the novel, has 
defeated Mrs. Moore. Personally, I took the echo to mean that individuals are trapped within their own limited understanding of the world. It's kind of the opposite of the, the wasp, which in this novel symbolizes a global unity. In the echo, people are hopelessly divided, and this gets at the central question posed in the first part of the novel about whether friendship can truly be possible between Indians and the English. And so the friendship, or attempted friendship, between Dr. Aziz and Mr. Fielding seems to be crucial. There's a misunderstanding where Dr. Aziz believes that that Fielding has wedded Miss Quested, and this naturally leaves him feeling betrayed. But more than that, there's a divide between them because of status and certain assumptions that they make about each other due to nationality, race, and religion. Forster amplifies it to such a degree as to state that the landscape itself comes between them. It suggests the colonial situation creates too wide a gulf between people to allow any true connection to take place. It's unsurprising that Dr. Aziz becomes completely jaded towards the English and doesn't want to have anything to do with them, uh, including Fielding, after the humiliation that he experienced. Fielding also seems to be stuck with his own prerequisites for how he thinks India should be, uh, as can be seen in how he contrasts uh, Venice with India. The great tragedy of this novel is that they aren't able to find any true connection with each other. Alongside following the final meeting between this pair of characters, the final section of this novel is concerned with a Hindu festival, which is really interesting knowing how Forrester found this religion so compelling when he visited India. To me, this conclusion is making multiple points that foreigners can never truly understand the experience of being Indian and that the traditions and culture of the country are ultimately stronger than any colonial power that tries to dominate it. However, I appreciate that this final section can feel somewhat meandering after such a character-driven story, and a lot of the, the readers in my book club found this. Overall, I was very impressed with this novel in handling and honestly portraying such a complex society. Certainly Forrester was writing from a certain background and his own generalizations about India and its people can be scrutinized in the narrative. But I believe this book was intended to highlight the levels of prejudice and misunderstandings which exist in everyone and how this led to a very difficult situation in a colonized country where Britain imposed its values and forced its dominance. Naturally, the novel can't present a solution to these dilemmas, but it presents them in all their complexity. I loved how Forrester follows the nuance of his character's emotions as they mature but don't necessarily progress. And it's fascinating how each of the characters struggle with their own sense of morality in a colonial system with such racial and religious tensions. In a way, the characters of Ronnie and Fielding are opposites in that they've both lived and worked in the country for an extended period of time, but they have very different ways of interacting with it and its citizens. Forster shows how people can become trapped in certain frames of mind that create divisions which can't be traversed. However, he also shows that there can be great beauty when there are true connections even if they only occur in fleeting moments. If you've read A Passage to India, I'd be very interested to hear your reaction to it. But another novel that I'd recommend if you've read this book is Damon Galgett's Arctic Summer, which fictionally reimagines Forster's life, including around the time of writing and publishing A Passage to India. I think it is such a moving and brilliant story. But of course, I have a penchant for novels about novelists. And after reading Forster's book, I also watched David Lean's film adaptation of A Passage 
to India,、uh, which was quite interesting. Although it was very long, it received multiple Academy Award、uh, nominations, and it's fairly good.、Uh, the cinematography of it is is quite spectacular.、Um, although in the story, it's more interested in following Adela rather than Aziz, and also the ending、uh, is quite. Simplified. It's more like a typical happy Hollywood ending. It's also very unfortunate that Alec Guinness portrays the Indian character of Professor Gobel, but many scenes and lines from the book are faithfully portrayed. And it's interesting how it visually represents many of the tensions raised in the novel. If you're a Forrester fan, I'd be keen to know where you think this novel ranks amongst. His books. I've read most of his work, and I think I prefer his novel *A Room with a View*. Although this book is definitely more ambitious and、uh, impressive in how it deals with such a large and complex subject, so I think it's definitely worthy of being called a, a modern classic. But if you've read it,、uh, or if you're interested in reading it now, please let me know about that in the comments below. But thank you for watching me discuss. This. I hope you're doing well and reading good things. I'll speak to you again soon. Bye bye.